I've been saying for weeks, guys, to be candid, like, if I'm teams like New Orleans or Pittsburgh, I would have signed him to a two-year deal because his mm -hmm. upside's compelling, and those teams don't have quarterbacks for next year. And when you can get a quarterback that's been a former MVP, he's not that old. Um, maybe he just needs a little bit more time after surgery because, again... All right, welcome in. Week 9 is in the books. Week 10 is upon us. It's the hurry up. I'm Albert Breer and here to help me break down everything going on in the NFL this week. To my left, we got former NFL player and scout Bucky Brooks. And to my right, we got former Jets and Dolphins executive Mike Tannenbaum. And guys, I think we have to start this week with Cam Newton, like almost out of nowhere over the last week. You know, you, you start to hear, OK, could he wind up back in Carolina after Sam Darnold goes down on Sunday against the Patriots? And here we are. It's Thursday afternoon. Cam Newton is again a Carolina Panther. Bucky, I'm going to start with you here. Like, what do you think about like his ability to kind of just come in and produce right away? And what can the Panthers do? Because they're obviously different quarterbacks, Sam and, 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 and Cam. And even P.J. Walker and Cam are much different players. Like, let's just start with what Cam has put on tape. You know, what he put on tape when he was a Patriot. I, like, what do you think that the, the the Panthers can do to get him out there and make him productive right away? And how much do you think he's got left in the tank? Well, the number one thing is his most talented supporting cast that he's ever had, going all the way back to his time, the first time around at Carolina. He didn't have receivers that he has like now in DJ Moore and Ronnie, Ronnie Anderson. He didn't have a running back necessarily consistently like Christian McCaffrey. So this gives him the support where even if he's a lesser version of himself at his best, he should be able to just distribute the ball and let those guys go to work. Whatever happened with the Patriots, I think you have to remember that system is very intricate, it's complex, and he was playing with lesser guys on the perimeter. And so it's really hard to evaluate who he is and what he was based on that, particularly after the COVID situation, because in my mind, there was such a drastic decline between the player that we saw pre-COVID and the player that we saw post-COVID. Mike, like how much do you think you, I don't know, throw out what we saw with Cam in New England? How much of it was, like Bucky said, like maybe a result of the circumstances around him? Yeah, I'm a huge Cam Newton fan. I mean, I, we, every time we faced him, he killed us. And uh, <laughs> I thought he was going to do really well in New England. And I don't know, you know, sometimes medically, guys, like when you're dealing with like certain body parts, like the shoulder of a throwing quarterback, um, sometimes it takes a little bit more time to Bucky's point, maybe COVID itself, you know, and uh, I'm as guilty as anybody when I say this, but like, I think sometimes when we talk about COVID, we, we have a tendency to minimize like, oh, well, he had COVID and, you know, COVID can be obviously extremely insidious to some, it's not a one size fits all, you know, you have it and then you're fine. So maybe that impacted him, but I think the risk reward is a no brainer. I, I've been saying for weeks, guys, to be candid, like if I'm teams like, New Orleans or Pittsburgh, I would have signed him to a two-year deal because his mm -hmm. upside's compelling and those teams don't have quarterbacks for next year. And when you can get a quarterback that's been a former MVP, he's not that old. Um, maybe he just needs a little bit more time after surgery because, again, I thought it would have gotten better up in New England than it did. And I think this signing was an absolute no-brainer. And, Bucky, we look at the upside on this deal, right? It's up to $10 million bucks. My read is that means his curtains on Sam Dar Darnold in Carolina. Is that the way you saw it too? Uh, I think so. I mean, I, look, they locked themselves in because they did the fifth-year option, but um, they gave Plant Sam a long run. And what you saw were all the issues that had popped up previously with the Jets. They reappeared in Carolina, even with a better supporting cast. We could even talk about maybe better coaching and all of that other stuff. Sam Darnold continued to play like Sam Darnold has played throughout the league. And so – uh, I just kind of believe that this is a situation for Cam to kind of show and prove easy to quarterback this year, but can he be the quarterback beyond? Because when you look at next year's draft class, there's not an answer and there's not an answer in free agency. So Cam could be the best option for the Carolina Panthers, not only in 2021, but in 2022, because there's nothing out there that can upgrade this quarterback situation. Albert, you know what I, I like I about this Bucky, guy? Yeah. I was just going to say like, to Bucky's point, I think he's absolutely nailing the real fundamental issue. Like, I totally agree with what Bucky just said. Like, and maybe this is not the perfect analogy, but like Cam now in his career, it's a little bit like Brian Fitzpatrick. Like, you can go win a lot of games with Cam Newton and gives you time to go develop the next guy. But there's so many teams that are going to need a quarterback next year. Maybe Russell Wilson changes teams. Maybe Aaron Rodgers does. 
but I'm hard pressed to think when I think about, you know, the Kenny Pickett's of the world or any, any of the guys in college, like, of course, a couple of them may work out, but who else are you going to get to play quarterback? If Cam's healthy, like, I think this makes a ton of sense. And with Sam, maybe bring them both back next year because they're locked in. I just love the optionality this gives Carolina. Yeah, and it's going to be cool, too. Like, And I, I think you're right. That's a great point by both you guys. That I think the draft class kind of hovers over everything here. Um, and the fact that that's going to affect the, the veteran market with Rodgers and Wilson and Watson when we get to the offseason, I think that's something we're all going to be looking at a few months down the line. And it's cool, too, that I think that maybe Cam finally gets closure here and that like the way he went out in, in, in January and February of 2020, I, for a guy of his stature in that organization, this isn't Matt Rule's fault, but it's just sort of unfortunate it ended that way. So it's cool to see a guy who's had that sort of, you know, who had that sort of level of accomplishment there, former MVP, is going to get this closure and is going to at least get another shot at going out the right way. Our final topic, we'll make this one quick um, for the week. We're doing midseason awards on the website this week. And I did a vote of executives. I got 30 ballots in right now, guys. And the MVP vote is incredibly close. It's Lamar Jackson's got eight votes. Tom Brady's got eight votes. Kyler Murray's got seven votes. So, Bucky, I'll start with you. Which of the three would you take? Are you going off the board with somebody else for your MVP? No, I mean, look, it's tough between Kyler Murray and Lamar Jackson. But I think if you look at what Lamar Jackson has done, I would say he hasn't even played his best football. But four game-winning drives or fourth-quarter comebacks, that's remarkable. Because remember, coming into the year, we said that was his Achilles heel, that if they get down, he can't bring them back. And so even though sometimes the football looks ugly, at the end of the day is can you get your team to the winner's circle? Given all the injuries and circumstances around this team, the fact that they're 6-2, and two, Lamar Jackson being top 10 in rushing and passing, he has to be in consideration for the MVP award. Mike, who you got? Yeah. Dak, you know, I think opening night, first game of the year told us a lot. And here's a guy that massive injury in the offseason last year, didn't have any training camp with his shoulder, and they, they're toe-to-toe with the world champs on Thursday night. And I just think when he's healthy, and it's I wish I could have said this last week before that Denver game, but they're really hard to beat. And I, I don't know. I think Dallas gets to the Super Bowl, and I think he's the main reason why. And um, taking nothing away from Lamar, certainly Kyler. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think Dak, when it's all said, I think this is going to be Dallas this year. I'm going with Lamar, and the reason why, it's pretty simple. No Ronnie Stanley, no J.K. Dobbins, no Gus Edwards. They still might be the best team in the AFC. And like Bucky said, he's getting over that stigma of being a quarterback who can't bring you back from behind. Okay, on my left, that's Bucky Brooks, former NFL scout, former NFL player. On my right, that's Mike Tannenbaum, ex-Jets and Dolphins executive. Appreciate you guys coming out.